Uh, hi again, thanks for joining this uh, uh, second session that is actually our last session on morning and afternoon of today's session of this uh, Geo Wetlands Edition uh, workshop. Um, it has been a long journey since we, we started with the idea to, uh, to 15 and, 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 and 20 people and at the end we, uh, we had uh, in total uh, almost 80 participants I guess. Um, this morning we had like uh, 45 uh, participants and um, um, we will not take too much time to make a, a wrap up of the, of the first day as we announced it. We will mainly uh, uh, remind that uh, it's a brainstorm meeting so it's hard to give a limit to it. It's hard to immediately uh, digest all ideas, also because the scale that it took is uh, much bigger than what we expected at the beginning. Um, and so the idea for this, uh, this session today is uh, to start uh, to discuss how we can get organized to take benefits and concrete actions to really uh, uh, deliver on uh, there's wetland issues from inventories and also uh, wetland-based solutions and, and, and how we can uh, coordinate better our international collaboration uh, based on Earth observation data uh, on these uh, different agendas. We had uh, this morning uh, participation from uh, colleagues from uh, Ramsar. They said they would come again. So um, I've, I'm sure they will appear. Maybe they are, some are here already. Um, and also from UNEP. So UNEP, Stuart Crane, unfortunately cannot participate uh, this afternoon, but he was, uh, he was present this morning. Yesterday, we, 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 uh, we achieved a, a, a quite impressive uh, um, uh, mind map. Uh, let, me, let me see how I can share it maybe here. I think, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, let me find it here. Yeah, this one. So, yeah, as you see, yesterday we, we did this connection between existing wetlands monitoring programs and the, the needs that Earth observation can support. And we see that uh, uh, we have uh, all type of scopes from global uh, to regional, national, and, 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 and even more local. On the regional side, we will have to see uh, how we can act actually which regions and how we can actually have more action on that region because we have very strong initiatives that deliver many products. So we'll have a, a specific sessions today about that. And today we will mainly focus on discussing how we can access to all this great data, how the users can access it. Um, is there data to produce their own final product or existing already processed final products that they can use for inventories or wetland-based solutions, uh, implementation and monitoring. Um, we will discuss about uh, regional collaboration, as I said, and wetland-based solutions really. And, and after that, we will have, we have with us today, Madiha Bajwa, she's our new Geowork program coordinator. So um, she will lead on uh, helping us to, to engage on a new implementation plan for the geo wetlands. And uh, you will see that we will feed uh, other parts of this mural platform. And we uh, especially wait for you to, to, to look at uh, engaging in what we said would be a leadership group and we are re renamed it, but you, you will discover that uh, after. So I will briefly uh, remind the agenda of today. Um, we will still have some presentation. Uh, some presentation, uh, so we will uh, start with, uh, uh, well, this is not a good one. No, sorry, uh, too many windows open. We will start with some presentation on uh, existing uh, um, um, observation, wetlands observation platforms. And we will, uh, after that, uh, uh, let me just, it's better if I share, I think you all. So yeah, here is the agenda. So we will have this wetlands observation platform, some some discussion will be, we'll start with presentation. We'll not have too much time for discussions. Our colleagues from GeoWetlands will remind what they wanted to achieve uh, during the first years, uh, the last years of GeoWetlands and what specifications they reach and also the difficulties. We will still have some presentation about some products that were, didn't find a place in the, uh, in, in the other day. So we'll have uh, some presentation of the also products. After that, we will have Alessio Sata from Medwet with Madia Bajwa from Geosec that will uh, animate a roundtable on fostering regional collaboration on wetland-based solutions. 
and after we will really uh, enter the, the, the actions to, uh, to, to have you engage, uh, to have what is not a geowetland leadership group, you will see how we, we are thinking to call it, and then some wrap up. So um, I don't know if uh, uh, where geowetland's colleague Mark uh, uh, Lamert or Adrian wants to say some introducing, uh, introdu um, introduction words, sorry, it was a long day before we start. See Mark that is here. Mark, do you want to say something for this last session today? Oh, no, no, no. What, what I was saying is, it's of course, it's a pity for those in the afternoon that haven't seen the presentation from the morning. But uh, I, I must say that um, all, all what happened during these two days has went really be, be beyond our expectations. Huh? So, uh, so, so it's so great to see uh, so, so many, um, so many projects, so many programs, programs active, and and ready to co to collaborate actually with Geo Wetlands. So that that's really. That's already a major achievement, I think, with what I've seen uh, during these last two days. But uh, bringing a challenge because we have now so many, uh, so many approaches, so many data, so many platforms, so many tools that, uh, and we need to, 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 to make them easily accessible and usable by, um, by, by the contracting parties of Ramsar. So that's um, that will be the major challenge that we will have in front of us. Uh, and that's, that's and that will be the main topic of today, actually, how we bring all, the, all these elements together in a way that is easily usable by the countries. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, so I, 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 as you see, we have here um, um, a list of presentation. Uh, and uh, I will try to go faster because this morning we had difficulties to respect time. So I, I will try, that's why I'm trying to run it a little bit to, as a start because after, I know after we enter the discussion, it's hard to stop then. So uh, Eleni, please, can you, could you please present us uh, the regional assessment of the Balkan Media Wetlands that was supposed to be presented this morning. And thank you so much for accepting to, to present it this afternoon. And I need to stop my, can you share your screen Eleni? Thank you, Loran. Good evening to everybody. Uh, I'm going to show very synoptic uh, in a very synoptic view uh, some uh, results we have uh, produced for the regional assessment of the Balkan Mediterranean wetlands on behalf of the project partners called Wet Main Areas, which was funded by the indirect uh, territorial program specifically for the Balkan Mediterranean region. Uh, the regional assessment uh, regarded five countries, Albania, Bulgaria, Greece, Northern Macedonia, and Cyprus, and uh, new wetland maps uh, generated to update national inventories. Uh, second uh, uh, area of uh, action was uh, uh, an assessment of the connectivity, and uh, we did that for uh, prioritizing uh, wetlands. Uh, in regard to their location with the protected areas. I will show you some results. And uh, uh, matching these two results, the, the wetland mapping and the connectivity assessment, we are now able to have some indication of priorities for conservation, protection, and restoration, uh, even inside or outside the, um, the areas. Here are uh, below some uh, uh, research paper and uh, publications for further uh, reading on what I'm going to show you. Uh, we used uh, Sentinel-2 uh, images. At the first step, uh, uh, we ran uh, water-related indices to locate uh, the wetland sites. And after that, uh, the results uh, have been further enhanced by national teams that we have built uh, in each of the five countries. Uh, so you see that uh, we reached a very high number of, uh, of uh, sites, uh, 8,800 uh, sites with a minimum size of uh, uh, 0.05 hectares. And this number does not uh, include rivers and streams, uh, reaching a total area of uh, uh, 531,000 uh, almost hectares. Uh, you see here in the, the figures uh, uh, on the right that uh, there is a very uh, big number of uh, small wetlands. Uh, total number of wetlands below uh, eight hectares are more than 6,000 uh, sites. And uh, this achievement uh, uh, is um, 
uh, was successful because of the use of the satellite technology. Otherwise, we would not be able to read such uh, a detail. Uh, and uh, this is one of uh, the success of our project because uh, usually small size or seasonal uh, wetlands are often omitted from mapping and um, other uh, uh, planning assessments. Uh, after that, uh, after, uh, after the, the national teams with uh, experts, wetland experts, uh, generated the final uh, wetland polygons with mainly with photo interpretation, uh, we built uh, this satellite-based service for monitoring the surface water dynamics. Uh, actually, this service uses uh, uh, the Sentinel-2 uh, images. Uh, every time that the, uh, a new image uh, overpasses the wetlands, each of all these wetlands, uh, the image is downloaded. Uh, the image then uh, calculated and processed and uh, several uh, indices uh, are calculated. You can see here in the right part uh, the results. And after all the uh, all the, the separate images are processed and uh, generate a map of water regime classes for all these uh, uh, wetlands. Uh, worth it to say that the service demonstrated it in the scarce ex exhibition that uh, was uh, 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 done during the space for our planet on this uh, September uh, as, a, um, as an example for the uh, SDG 6 uh, uh, clean water and sanitation uh, target. Uh, the other tool we have produced was a web geo portal in order to uh, upload all these uh, results, all these uh, in, in a total, uh, at this moment there are 97 layers uh, with uh, uh, the emerald uh, or the emerald sites for North uh, Macedonia and uh, uh, Albania uh, and the Natura 2000 sites for the European uh, uh, countries, Greece, Cyprus and Bulgaria, the connected areas, the wetland polygons. So uh, the users can download all these shape files and make their analysis. Uh, here are some graphs for the, the connectivity assessment uh, uh, is a spatial analysis. It's quite complex, but we managed to, to have uh, coordinated and harmonized uh, results with the collaboration of these national teams uh, I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we did it wall to wall for, for the whole uh, territory of the Balkan Mediterranean countries. So uh, we have now layers, spatial layers for the connected land which is favorable for uh, biodiversity. We have uh, now statistics for how much of the wetland area is located either in connected or non-connected areas and so on. So we can have some indication of priorities. Here is an example of Greece. Uh, on the right side, you see uh, the result uh, for the Greek uh, area. Uh, many, many statistics uh, can be uh, extracted. Uh, you can uh, uh, imagine. So, for example, uh, you see here that there are some uh, 900 wetland sites uh, that are located in uh, hostile land, which means that it's mainly agriculture or urban areas. And this, uh, is, this is an indication of a priority for conservation of uh, these sites as uh, biodiversity islands and stepping stones essential for aquatic uh, life. Uh, also, uh, there are some uh, 200 wetland sites uh, that are found in unconnected land, which is, uh, on the other hand, favorable for biodiversity for biodiversity. It is this green rose here, uh, here uh, which is uh, surely uh, an indication for conservation and restoration, given that they are located in land which is favorable for biodiversity. All these data, of course, uh, were based on land cover uh, maps on biodiversity uh, data sets, on uh, human activities uh, data sets, and so on. Uh, so with this uh, way, uh, we can have a first uh, picture of where to uh, 
concentrate and where to focus uh, priorities of uh, wetland, Balkan, Mediterranean uh, areas. This is from my side. I try to be very short. <laughs> I know it's a big. Uh, uh, it it should require should require further details. Uh, we hope to have Maybe. other 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 time in other uh, meetings. Uh, the possibility to share more the methodologies and uh, uh, the, concept, the concepts behind. Thank, thank you for you. the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, it was short, but it was uh, you went straight to the point. You've shown great examples, so I'm sure we motivate everyone to, to collaborate with your team. Thank you so much. And I think also it, it will uh, be useful for our discussion for regional collaboration. Um, so uh, okay. trying to keep the momentum, uh, um, did, do we have any comments? Is Mark, did, you, did, you, did somebody say something? No, oh, okay. Um, yeah, we would like to continue with uh, Lola Fatoyimbo uh, that will present NASA Blue Carbon Team monitoring Blue Carbon Ecosystem Change and Carbon Budgets. Uh, Lola, are you here? Yeah. Hello, good morning, everyone. Oh, good. Uh, for me, it's good morning. For you, it's good afternoon. Yeah, good morning, Lola. <laughs> here it's good afternoon. And, and, uh, and for Osamu in Japan, it's good night. So, good evening, yes. <laughs> Okay, let me share my slides really quickly. And I will also try to go through as fast as I can. Um, yeah, say the essential things, don't, don't run. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. We'll see it, Perfect. no problem. Okay, great. So um, today I'm presenting um, some of the efforts on uh, understanding blue carbon ecosystems that we have been working at at NASA. Um, and introducing our NASA Blue, Blue Carbon team, um, who's been, and we've been working on global monitoring of blue carbon ecosystem change and, and carbon budgets as well. So to give you a, a, a quick overview um, of what we're, what we're doing and who we are, um, primarily a team of researchers who are located at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So that is my team. We have collaborators and co-investigators at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California as well as the University of Maryland and East Carolina University. Um, and what we're primarily working on is uh, generally speaking on, a, on, we work on large scales, so global to regional scales. And we are focused really on better understanding the extent and changes in the three-dimensional structure of um, coastal wetlands and blue carbon ecosystems. So, um, going beyond the extent and looking at canopy height, biomass, and carbon stocks um, of these systems, as well as change. Um, and then, you know, in the future, our goal is really to expand our work from, from specific ecosystems that we've been focusing on, primarily really on mangroves, to, to doing a more complete land-ocean continuum mapping um, in support of science um, and applications and management, such as SDG tar targets, climate action. Um, oh, and, and here I wanted to kind of highlight some of the, um, some of our partners and organiza organizations that we are, we are already working with. Um, we, we, are, um, work, we work very closely with the Global Mangrove Watch and the Global Mangrove Alliance, as well as Conservation International and the US Forest Service International Programs. Um, there are also several NASA internal programs that we work with that are interested in blue carbon ecosystems and in coastal wetlands, um, such as the Land Cover Land Use Change Program, um, the Applied Sciences Program, and then we have a, an, a campaign that is focused on better understanding greenhouse gas emissions coming from uh, coastal wetlands such as mangroves and um, tidal marshes and freshwater marshes in Florida. Um, and this project is called Blue Flux. And so to give a quick overview, we, we work with a whole suite of different sensors, but, but primarily on um, combining uh, data from uh, SAR measurements, such as TandemX, the digital elevation model, or the SRTM DEM, um, that have wall-to-wall -wall, three-dimensional data, and then improving them by by calibrating specific measurements that we get from JEDI, so the um, uh, Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation LIDAR that is on the International Space Station or from ISAT-2 and ISAT-GLASS, which are two um, other NASA LIDAR missions. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll walk really quickly through some of the examples of work that we've done. We produced a global mangrove canopy height uh, and biomass and carbon stock map um, for the year 2000 um, at 30 meters resolution. Um, this data has been published now several years ago. It's been incorporated into several of the platforms I think that we've heard about today, including the Global Mangrove Watch platform. Um, and, and highlighting some, some key areas here, for example, in Gabon. And now really what we're working on is um, updating the map with um, better data on all fronts. Um, we're using um, the Tandem X digital elevation model, which is at 12 meter resolution to um, estimate canopy height in, in mangroves, as well as JEDI data from the JEDI LIDAR on the International Space Station and um, increasing amount of field measurements that are being collected all over the world um, to estimate carbon stocks in mangroves. And so here I wanted to show a nice example of, of uh, collection of JEDI data. For example, this is Florida. And what you see here in the, on the Southern tip of Florida um, is uh, the Florida Everglades. So this is the mangroves part of, of, that, of the national park. Everything here is grasslands, and you can see very clearly that there is a difference here in structure with each spike representing, it's, it's an estimation of canopy height or, or biomass also. You can see in the middle, it's all very short, and then we have some areas with, with taller trees. So we're really taking into account the information that we get from that third dimension to better understand um, carbon dynamics um, and other ecosystem services can be estimated as well. Um, we've also worked on um, better understanding the changes in mangrove extent um, and what's driving that change. So we've produced a map of global mangrove um, loss drivers um, from 2000 to 2016. This is also available um, online for download. We, we have a dashboard where you can um, look at the data or you can download the data directly. Um, I, I won't really go through all of the results that we found here, but if you have questions, feel free to ask me later. We, we've separated into five main drivers of loss, including erosion, um, uh, commodities, so that includes aquaculture and agriculture. We have extreme weather events such as drought or tropical storms and hurricanes. Non-productive conversion is essentially cutting or felling with not, no replacement of a land cover. Um, after the, the cutting, and then coastal squeeze essentially, or, or settlements um, is another section, is another um, driver. And here I'm showing the coastal squeeze one where you're essentially seeing a driver from the landward side and from the seaward side, um, resulting in mangrove losses. <clears throat> and then finally, I wanted to highlight a study that we've been conducting for a few years um, in the Florida Everglades in particular, where we're looking at increasing climate stressors and effects of um, hurricanes on mangrove resiliency. So here we flew with airborne data before, um, airborne LIDAR before and after Hurricane Irma in 2017. We flew in 2017, in 20, uh, March, November, and then again in 2020 um, to get pre and post storm data. And again, all of this data is available online um, freely for, for analysis. Um, but we've also done some of the analysis ourselves. And this then led to this Blue Flux project, which is really focused on um, taking our measurements to the next level where we are not, where we're estimating the stocks and the changes, but also directly measuring greenhouse gas emissions, especially um, carbon dioxide and uh, methane emissions and also tying this with the state of the forest. Because what we're seeing um, in Florida, which I'm sure many people are seeing all over the world, is that there is an increase in these, in these ghost forests, which is what I'm showing at the bottom right here, where you have um, you know, changes in the salinity, changes in the, in the hydrology, and coupled with extreme storm events that are leading to large-scale die-offs. Um, and then finally, um, a, a lot of the methodologies that we have developed for mapping mangroves can also be applied to other um, coastal ecosystems. So we have now um, just submitted a new uh, um, analysis of global salt marsh change from 2000 to 2017. Um, so that's in review right now, um, but the map will be made available soon online as well. 
And now the last thing we're working on is to kind of get to that, that last um, system, which is in some ways the most difficult one, which is those submerged um, uh, blue carbon systems. So seagrass meadows. And, and here really we, we are um, not at the point of mapping seagrass med meadows yet, but what we're interested in is improving the bathymetry, at least the shallow coastal bathymetry using direct measurements. And so um, we're lucky enough to have data from the ISAT-2 um, mission, which um, has been shown to do really well at co collecting shallow water bathymetry. Um, it collects it in, in samples. So we have these tracks all over the world. It's not, it's not wall to wall data, but what we can do is use the data from the sample tracks to train um, satellite um, derived bathymetry with optical data. So we've worked with Sentinel as well as um, Landsat data to generate um, a gridded bathymetry from space. Um, so here I'm showing an example of, of an area uh, in the Bahamas. This is the area that has the clearest water worldwide. So um, it's an area where you can do a really good job at um, estimating shallow coastal water bathymetry um, from optical data. And now we also have the, the, the LIDAR data to uh, validate and ca calibrate our measurements. Um, and um, then finally, I think this is my last slide. Um, you know, we've talked, I think, a lot about um, specific ecosystems, but in, eventually, I think the goal is to um, combine all of these measurements that we have from different organizations, from different projects, and really have um, harmonized or um, interchangeable, usable data sets. And so in a partnership that we have with Conservation International, we've been working on using our measurements to help inform natural capital accounting, for example. And um, here I'm showing an example of a, a land cover map, which will be, um, which, we're, which we're using to derive an ecosystem extent map. So a map that's even more ecologically um, accurate. Um, that includes the coastal wetlands, the flooded forests, and the differentiation between seasonal and permanent. Um, and hopefully, we'll also be able to include them more of the coastal zone in some of these efforts as well. And with that, I will end um, my presentation and take any questions if you need it. Thank you. I, I understand. And you were stressed because there was a lot of things. Thanks so much. It's impressive work. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank and you. congratulations for being able to, to present it so 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 quickly. We'll have time for more questions and conversation. We'll just go through all these presentations and after have a brainstorm meeting. And I don't know if you know that just after you comes actually our uh, colleagues from Gabon. And so it will not be Farel, uh, that will Zingu, Buka, but it will be uh, Francis Manfumbi that will present. Francis, are you with us? I'm going to share um, your presentation. And Francis will present actually in French, and I will translate live. And uh, I hope it will go smoothly. Francis, are you with us? Oui, bonsoir, bonsoir. Good evening. Uh, good evening. So uh, my presentation is in English, so I present in French. Uh, is... Okay, you. I will translate. Je vais te. Je vais traduire uh, en direct. Hein? Okay. Okay. Ça marche. Donc, uh, je repas. Bonsoir à tous. Good evening. Je vais faire la présentation en remplacement de mon collègue Farel qui est un qui est un empêchement. I will take the uh, place of my colleague Farel that unfortunately cannot be here today. Okay. Donc, je vais rapidement présenter le, le système de suivi de mangrove euh, au Gabon dans le cadre d'un projet SUMAC, donc le suivi euh, des mangroves du Gabon, qui est un projet de uh, qui... project of Statute Mate of Gabon's Mangrove Forest uh, in the context of the SUMAC project. Donc, ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est que le projet SUMAC rentre dans le cadre du projet SCO, donc euh, le SCO international. Le Gabon fait partie et au Gabon, nous avons mis en place le SCO national. So, uh, the SUMAC project, uh, uh, oops, ah, OK, there is transcription in, in live, it looks like. So, it looks like, you, uh, apparemment, tu vas pouvoir parler, donc, uh, en, en, 
en français et ça va être traduit en direct. Looks like we, he will speak and it will be translated automatically, so I don't have to translate. I will just translate what he said. He said that uh, Sumag's project is uh, being uh, 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 done in the context of the Space Climate Observatory. Uh, uh, Gabon is doing a national Space Climate Observatory, um, and, uh, and uh, from uh, from uh, which this project is uh, uh, is linked. Bah, tu peux parler maintenant en français, ça sera, ça sera traduit. OK. Donc, comme, comme vous le savez, le Gabon euh, a un important écosystème euh, forestier dont on, a, on retrouve les mangroves qui se situent le long de la côte. Et le Gabon a la particularité d'avoir euh, l'une des mangroves les plus hautes. Et la, la plupart de ces mangroves sont situées en zone urbaine, ce qui donne euh, un intérêt de suivi euh, permanent parce que, euh, la pression anthropique euh, du point de vue population, augmentation de la population, mais également euh, la construction, l'augmentation de l'urbanisation fait en sorte que ces mangroves urbaines là sont beaucoup mises sous pression, tel que vous pouvez le voir sur cette carte d'occupation du sol, toutes les zones qui sont… Je vais, je vais quand même traduire parce que la traduction euh, « The robot cannot replace me yet, so okay, I will okay, translate, okay. I don't think it's possible to understand this thing. » So, uh, you may not know, but Gabon has the highest… Uh, some of the highest mangroves in the world. Uh, and also, as you can see on this map, uh, some of these mangroves are in a urban environment with a lot of pressure. So it's, that's why they are suffering a lot and that's why it's important to, to monitor them. Tu peux continuer. Donc l'un des objectifs, dans le diapo suivante, l'un des objectifs de la mise en place de ce projet de suivi de mangroves, donc on peut le voir ici, c'est un exemple, la détection 2017-2020, les mangroves urbaines autour de Libreville, suivant diapo. So as you can see, one of the goals of the project is to monitor the change detection. You can see here two examples with these images of a change detection of the mangroves. Donc c'est également euh, cette vue donc euh, tout long, toute la côte gabonaise qui est dans cette mangrove. Donc ce qu'il faut dire c'est que l'un des objectifs euh, de ce de ce projet c'est de mettre en place cette infrastructure qui permettra de suivre en quasi temps réel les la mangrove du Gabon. So as you can see here, you have a, a, an overall view of the uh, entire coastland uh, and mangroves of Gabon. And so one of the projects is actually to build an infrastructure to be able to monitor uh, in near real time um, the Gabonese mangrove, uh, uh, yeah, Gabonese mangroves. Voilà. Donc, à, à l'intérieur de, de ce système, nous aurons trois composantes. Euh, C'est vrai qu'aujourd'hui, au niveau de la GEOS, nous faisons de la détection de ces mangroves du point de vue spatial, mais ce projet va amener d'autres caractéristiques, donc d'autres composantes, notamment sur les différents indicateurs, euh, notamment la qualité de l'eau, les, les pressions anthropiques sur le, le terrain, mais également le type de mangrove. Donc, on aura la spatialisation du type de mangrove, parce qu'au Gabon, nous avons la mangrove de façon générale, nous avons différents types de mangroves. So this project will not only look at the mangrove extent, but also will uh, characterize, uh, characterize other indicators such as uh, uh, um, threat and pressure, but also the type of mangrove because they have very different types of mangroves in, in, in Gabon. Donc, euh, objectif également important pour ce, pour ce suivi de mangrove, c'est également pour, pour euh, euh, cartographier le, stock, le stockage de carbone au niveau des mangroves parce que laissant savoir que la mangrove est un est un écosystème qui a une bonne capacité de stockage, mais, ég mais également le sous-bois sous de la mangrove, c'est-à-dire à, à l'intérieur de la mangrove, le souterrain mangrove fait une bonne captation de mangrove. Donc, c'est important également, là, ce sujet, de suivre la mangrove, non seulement du point de vue spatial, mais les indicateurs, c'est-à-dire la qualité de l'eau, la qualité des mangroves, mais aussi le type de mangrove pour voir quel est le type de mangrove Gabon qui stocke le plus de carbone, quel est le type de mangrove qui est le plus en plus, qui est de plus... Uh, de plus en plus mis uh, face à la menace au niveau anthropique. So uh, another issue is about carbon stocks. As you know, mangroves are an important ecosystem to stock uh, carbon. And so uh, it also depends on the type of mangrove and the quality of the water, uh, uh, the canopy, but also what, uh, what type of, uh, of uh, bushes and plants you have inside. So they, they want to make a, a full uh, biomass uh, estimation of these different types of mangroves to actually estimate these carbon stocks. Oui. Donc, euh, donc voilà euh, un peu en gros à quoi ressemble la plateforme actuellement parce qu'elle est en cours de développement donc euh, la plateforme de cartographie du suivi de mangroves à l'intérieur on, on va pouvoir retrouver euh, les différentes publications sur les mangroves euh, toute la documentation qui a été faite les cartes et le suivi se passant en quasi temps réel donc avec les, les partenaires donc le ministère des forêts la, le conseil national climat les parcs nationaux 
et les universités, l'université du Gabon, donc l'université polytechnique et l'université au Maroc. So this is a view of the platform. As you can see, you have uh, two resources. You will have access to all the maps and, uh, and special data, and also all the reports and documents that they are producing. And this project was done in collaboration with uh, the, the Gabonese uh, national parks, uh, two universities, Polytechnic and, and Omar Bongo, and also the ministers of environment and uh, water and forest. Donc, c'est un peu, comme je le disais, la, la, un overview de, de ces différentes plateformes avec euh, des couches telles que l'occupation du sol, les couches sur les différents types de mangroves qui seront implémentées à l'intérieur, l'ensemble des statistiques et, qui sont associées aux différents types de mangroves. So as you can see, you have the different types of mangroves, the biomass, some of the statistics, uh, and, all, and explanation of the classification with, uh, with some uh, um, superficie uh, areas that are being uh, measured. Donc, c'est un peu l'interface qu'on peut voir, donc l'ensemble des, des publications scientifiques, mais également des vidéos, parce que l'objectif, un des objectifs de cette plateforme, c'est des vidéos également éducatives euh, pour enseigner, pour éduquer qu'est-ce qu qu que c'est la mangrove, à quoi elle sert. Euh, vraiment, c'est des objectifs éducatifs également que nous comptons atteindre à, à, à partir de cette plateforme. So also on this platform, we will have all scientific publications, reports, but also some videos because there is also they want to, uh, to educate the population and the young about the, uh, why mangroves are important. So this platform will also uh, be used for uh, in the school and educative system in Gabon. So c'est également l'ensemble des, 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 des différentes pages que nous pourrons également voir dans cette plateforme. And you can see all this example of this video. So, merci. Merci à vous. C'est un peu de façon euh, résumée euh, la présentation sur le système de suivi de mangrove que nous sommes en train de mettre en place. Merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, I hope my, my uh, I have to stop. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I hope my translation in live was okay for everyone. Um, and let's continue. Thank you so much. Hein. It's, uh, it's, it's great that we... Uh, it's not easy for everyone to speak in English, so it's great, Francis, that you, you could also give it in French. Uh, now we will continue with, uh, we will go to another part of the world. We'll go back to Brazil now with uh, Rogerio Flores, if uh, Rogerio is here to present Sentinel-1 data cubes and water bodies extraction from them. So now we'll go back to another type of platform that give you access to data, but give you access actually to how can we process big data for wetlands uh, 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 estimations. Roger, you, can you share your presentation? Thank you. Bon dia. Uh, eh, bon dia ainda no Brasil. Bon dia. <laughs> yeah, we uh, can okay, see your uh, screen. Yeah, that's okay. You can see, you can hear me well? Yeah, very well. Okay, uh, so I will start. Uh, on behalf of the Brazilian uh, Data Cube, I will present uh, Sentinel-1 Data Cubes and uh, Water Body Extraction as a uh, study case uh, this project uh, is in the context of Bond's project, which is the biodiversity scenarios for Amazonian wetlands. And uh, we are working together between IRD in France and IMPI in Brazil through the Brazilian Data Cube to produce this cube. So uh, just talk a little bit of the BDC project. It's a research development and technological innovation project here at IMPI that uh, is producing data sets for big volumes, big volumes of median resolution uh, remote sensing images. The project is composed of a uh, big infrastructure that collects the image, satellite image as Sentinel-2, uh, Landsat-8, and MOJIS to pr process in cubes and uh, just these cubes uh, in our uh, grids. As you see here, we have different grids for different uh, uh, size uh, resolution of images. And then uh, after this, we prepare this data in a database that can be distributed for the general public, for the users. And uh, on top of this uh, database, we provide services that uh, uh, make easier the, the process of uh, accessing and uh, downloading or getting this data as we have the Spatial temporal uh, stack catalog that uh, catalog all the, the the cubes and assets we have. We also have the OGC services, that's WFS and WMS, which can be used uh, by the final users in programming languages or uh, GIS programs as QGIS, ArcGIS. 
And on top of all the services, we also provide some uh, application that does these abstractions for us as the, the BDC portal here on top that every user can log in and browse for every uh, scene uh, over Brazil, over the Brazil uh, for each product that we just, uh, make available. Also, we have the Jupyter Hub, which uh, allow the, the user to research on top of the data and produce uh, new uh, discoveries, as I will show the example after. And also, we have uh, packages called Seeds, which allow the users to extract from the cubes uh, time series uh, data. So you, you can uh, use for land use and land cover uh, classification. So for the Sentinel, when uh cube we are building as almost the the same as the the cubes we have uh, already in the brazil data cube we are uh getting the data from external providers as isa and uh, the only difference we have a pre-processing chain that's needed for the s1 images the reader the images to be uh available, to be ready for use so this pre-processing is uh, being done uh, in partnership with IRD that developed the, the automated chain of uh, processing using uh, SNAP from ESA through the Python uh, API. And this, this process is uh, aimed to, to correct like apply orbit, uh, thermal noise removal, speckle filtering to get uh, in the end a Sentinel-1 GRD image ready to be used as coming back here to the, the main part as a analysis ready data. And uh, in the BDC, we have uh, an uh, app that comes get this analysis ready data and uh, build cubes and then publish them in our databases as the other uh, cubes. We also provide the image collections uh, as a stack of images without being cubes uh, as a data available for users. In terms of my, my PhD and the Bones project, I have been developing a study of case. I use the, the lower Amazon food plains as a study area, and I, I was able to process uh, 30 images from the year of 2020. And uh, using an uh, algorithm of uh, deep learning, the UNET, the fully convolutional UNET, we trained with 2,500 uh, training samples and 650 validation samples to extract the water bodies from uh, the other other areas. So uh, this is this uh, study case was uh, a study case to understand that uh, uh, if we can use the infrastructure of the Brazil data cube, not only to get the image but also to uh, develop uh, um, uh, other researches. And in this partnership between IRD and Brazil data cube, we've been able to. Uh, get some nice results. Uh, we've been uh, uh, getting accuracy better than the traditional thresholding methods that's used to uh, quantify, class sorry, classify water. Uh, here we see an example of the, the months that is high water and the level of water is really high. We got the Jacquard index or uh, intersection over unit index greater than 95%. In the worst result we get is 93% in the low water when the, the water is really shallow and the, the mix between ter uh, terrain and wetlands are hard to identify. So this is my presentation and I'd like to thank you this space here and Gio to present our work. Thank you so much for Gio. Congratulations for your PhD. You're, you're a lucky guy to be in such a team. Uh, and I, this team involved much more than IRD and EDP. We have also uh, Laura Hess and all the colleagues from Vienna. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of you are, you are mm -hmm. one of the best remote sensing team on wetlands of the planet. So congratulations. I think it's also very complimentary to, to the NASA presentation because the, it was great to have also some very fancy remote sensing and new things. And we didn't talk about NISA. I know Laura wanted to talk about that. I don't think we will have a chance to, but uh, it's great to see how we can handle different this is big data. And from the geo point of view, we have also Digital Africa and Geoscience Australia with who we work. We are not able to, to have them to this meeting, but they are very much interested also. So it could be also the opportunity to use this data cube. And data cube really is to, to use all the, the historical data that we have. So it's a, it's a great tool to, to think for, for wetlands application. Uh, thank you so much. So now we will continue with uh, Brazilian uh, uh, INPI colleague. Uh, I want to see if 
have uh, Claudio Barbosa is with, with us. Are you here, Claudio? Can you present uh, your work from the project Mappa Quali? Uh, so quality of water, modular system for continuous monitoring of inland water quality by satellite. So uh, Claudio is, uh, is an old friend. He's one of the best world specialists on, on water quality. So Claudio, please, floor is yours. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. First, thanks, uh, Laurent, for this opportunity to present the, the development of a modular system for systematic monitoring aquatic ecosystem, which we are developing in Labiza, and we named it MAPAQUALI. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce the instrumentation laboratory for aquatic system, Labiza, where the system is being developed. Well, for more than 15 years at INPE, we have been working on remote sense methods for studying aquatic ecosystem. And in 2013, we created LABISA, which has the following mission to support and stimulate research on the development of tools based on Earth observation data for monitoring a Brazilian aquatic system. The main objectives of LABISA are carry out uh, optical and immunological measurement to validate earth observation data, and also uh, to calibrate uh, algorithms uh, to de develop uh, biological algorithms to derive water quality indicator, as well as training human research to use aquatic remote sensors methodologies. Our current uh, uh, goals uh, is uh, continuous, derived time series map of uh, what they call uh, indicators. So based on LABIS objective and goals, we are building a biological database of Brazilian inland waters from in situ data collected over the last 50 years along the Brazilian territory. And uh, using this database, developing biological algorithm to derive uh, what they call an indicator. These are some examples of what are called indicator maps that uh, LABISA will provide. The first one is maps of uh, chlorophyll in different period uh, uh, at a reservoir in Sao Paulo State. And uh, the next is uh, a map of uh, uh, depth in the, the Amazon Fort Plain. <clears throat> well, uh, after being skilled the in developing integrated algorithms for some aquatic system, we proposed to develop a uh, map quality in Python language. Very quickly, the conceptual structure of uh, map quality is uh, first we have a model, image selection and preprocessing model, uh, preprocess image database. Uh, what quality indicate algorithms? This is calibrate algorithms. Uh, uh, the data time series mapped data set and uh, a web uh, web model where a user interact with the, the system. This uh, conceptual model uh, led into this uh, implementation uh, structure. For example, the, the image and selection uh, model, image selection preprocessor model result in this uh, a lot of, of uh, process here in, in, in the, the system. Uh, this, this model run in pipeline, uh, is run in pipe, as a pipeline process. Uh, this pipeline is programmed for periodically uh, searching and, and per process image from the Brazilian data cube and uh, deposit the results into ARCH uh, data set. Uh, uh, data set, okay. The, the, the RG means uh, analysis, analysis red data images. Okay? Uh, the water color in, in indicator algorithms model, the disparse also run as pipeline process. They periodically search for preprocessed image and derive what they call indicators and uh, deposit them in, 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 in the database. This is a, another example of the, the maps that we will produce using MAPAQUALI. In this case, is a diffuse attenuation uh, map. You know? 
Here we have the, the front end of Mapaquali. Sorry, it's in Portuguese because we are developing that system. From this, uh, th this interface, you can assess the, the, the system. And this is an example how to, to search for product in, in the system. You select, sorry, I think the front of this. You have the, the location, the, the, the range of data that you are looking for, uh, searching for data and the products that's, that, that are available in, in, in our database. And that's all uh, that I would like to, to show about uh, the system that we are develop, developing. That uh, the, the, the Portuguese version will be running uh, at the, the end of these years, I think. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claudio, to share. I mean, uh, what you said, just 50 years of ENP doing it, bringing so much effort to have this kind of results. And, and wetland is not only vegetation, correct? It's also water. And it's great to characterize this water. So your work is so important. Thank you so much. And we're so thankful for ENP to all the work you are doing. Um, uh, so uh, will be our last presentation. We are running late today. We were running next this morning, don't worry. The same thing, we, we, we wanted to have all this presentation uh, so that, I mean, uh, we could have an, a, a real overview. We didn't know we'd have so much success. That's why we are late. Uh, but uh, we will have now um, uh, a, a presentation about from uh, 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 Frédéric Huyn. Uh, Frédéric Huyn, he's the director of Data Terra. Data Terra uh, are all uh, data from French institution about the Earth system. And Frédéric will represent a project called Gaia Data, and he will uh, uh, show how this project can help to integrate approach for wetlands data and services. Frédéric, please, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to participate to this important meeting. I understood that I was, uh, I have to, to be very quick. So I'm sorry for, for that. So I will present uh, some uh, view of um, the Data Terra research infrastructure, uh, which is built in France with several institutions that you can see the logo. My presentation will be in uh, three parts. So a um, few words about uh, what is this uh, research infrastructure, which is uh, an answer to the complexity of the Earth system, which is very complex has to be approaches at different scale and the interaction between the different compartments, ocean, uh, atmosphere, uh, uh, land, uh, land surfaces, and so on. So to understand these processes, it's important to have a capacity to integrate different kind of uh, important volume of data and complex data, satellite in situ campaign long-term observation. So the idea is to build this uh, capacity to, to answer to different needs uh, for science. Okay, so the, the main goal is to, uh, to develop this global uh, system to access to data, product, and, and, and treatments to observe, understand, and predict in, uh, in an integrated way the, the evolution of the Earth system. So it builds on uh, four data hub on the different compartments that you can see here, atmosphere, ocean, land surfaces and uh, also uh, solid earth with different services uh, from to be to be very very close to the scientific community and to develop in a long term aspect this capacity you can see some uh, some members uh, this is an important infrastructure which is more than 40 million euros each year and um, a lot of product and users that can be uh, that can use this uh, research infrastructure. A few words about the Gaia Data project, which is what can be a contribution to the wetland uh, project, the geo wetland project. So that's why I will present shortly what is this project. So first, I, wa I want to, to share with you, and I, and I know that a lot of things has already uh, discussed in that, that wetland monitoring, there is some different challenges. There is some difficulty because the system is very dynamic, so you have to, to approach the system at different scale with a lot, a lot of uh, diversity of data in a long-term perspective to support uh, the production of uh, interoperable data and reusable data, but also to build indicators. So for doing that, you need several kinds of services uh, to access to in-situ data in a long-term perspective, to satellite data, to combine the different sensors, 
and to produce different indicators, but also to support the use of models to combine those data in a, in a fair by design approaches. So you can see that uh, this project is built for more than eight years, supporting by uh, the, the French government uh, uh, financial support. Uh, um, and the idea is this project is um, supported by free research infrastructure to cover all the scope of the environmental and uh, earth system uh, domains. Climary, which is the, the national research infrastructure, but also international research infrastructure dedicated to, to climate uh, simulation to support the, the GIEC, for example. And the PNDB is the biodiversity research infrastructure info. So we are together to build this different kind of services that you can see on the, on the screen. Uh, discovery and access services, virtual and environmental capacity data analytic platform. And for that, we have to build a sort of a big network with the data lake to be uh, to, to share the data and to offer to the users the capacity to, to share and produce the data uh, very near from their, their own needs. So this uh, slide show that uh, this is not a project. Uh, uh, this project is connected to, to national and European project, thematic project, and also technical project, but also is in connection with the European big uh, project, such as uh, Copernicus, uh, and also the S3 uh, research infrastructure at European level. And it's a part also uh, as to support, to, to, to contribute to GEO. So I don't want to, 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 to make, uh, so this is the organization with important similarity with the other platforms. So this is a good chance to, to collaborate and to share this kind of uh, services and also infrastructure. So a few examples of what is uh, already uh, possible with, the, with this infrastructure, you can, uh, you can have access to different kind of uh, product. Uh, they are permanent products, so this is very important for that kind of uh, problematics. So, for example, soil, uh, surface soil moisture, risk infectious disease, which is related to the, to, the, to the water and the dynamic of the water, and also for coastal wetlands. Here you can have uh, an example of product that uh, is derived from this small mission. Uh, you, can, you can have... Um, uh, a root zone, uh, so you, you can have an estimation and to monitor the humidity of this important root zone. So that can be a contribution for a global indicator. And this, this kind of product are already uh, operational and you can see all the area where all those data are already uh, accessible. Another example is uh, the services that uh, a lot of uh, people in the room knows uh, very well, it is the capacity from the satellite to, uh, to derive some uh, water level and river, uh, river and uh, water level for, for rivers and lakes in uh, all over the world. So these uh, services are already accessible to, to be combined to other kind of uh, data. Another example is uh, some high resolution soil moisture maps which is a combination between uh, different uh, Sentinel product and algorithm to produce at a really local scale, uh, some uh, maps on the, uh, the soil moisture at very high resolution. So it's, it can be done at different uh, scale and for different region. And this, project, this product is already uh, operational. Another example, which is more a coastal zone, you can, uh, you can have some, uh, capacity to have some information about the bathymetry, about coastline monitoring and so on. So the idea is not to, to describe all the product, but to, to say that we can use that kind of things to share uh, that kind of process and information to contribute to the, to, the, to the project. So in conclusion, the idea for us is, uh, is, is to, be, to be part of this initiative and to to, to, to discuss with the, with the partners how we can share experiences, how we can uh, contribute to this data sharing and distributed uh, services adapted to, to, to communities, but also to decision maker and uh, civic society. 
And also the important thing is that this capacity is uh, open to, uh, to support some treatment, to support some, uh, some storage, and also to develop some uh, virtual analysis that dedicated to, to, to wetland uh, uh, needs. So this is uh, just to contribute. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frédéric. And thank you also. I think it was great also to have this slide of contribution. We would like to have this from all institutions, how you can contribute. I think we should have asked that from the beginning. But you know, it's when you're reaching the last days that you think, well, we didn't ask us that before. We ask it actually on the mirror platform. So, uh, um, and I've seen that your name was already, uh, somebody uh, uh, dedicated, you put your name to actually participate to this, to this future of the leader group of this uh, wetlands activity that we don't call leader group, we will show how we call it. Mark, we are late on time again. And so I think we should, uh, what do you think? We should maybe conclude this session of presentation. We don't have to, too much time to go in detail of platforms. Maybe you want to say some words and then we can uh, give the floor to Alessio and Madiha. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's clear that uh, what we would have liked in these sessions to discuss a bit how we put because we, we've seen different um, uh, yeah different presentations showing data sets, showing solutions with platforms. Uh, some are very specific, like the mangroves. This one, uh, the, the the Gaia, the, the, yeah, the Gaia data is is a very interesting one. It's more on the science, I would say, that really on responding directly to the needs of the. Of the of the Ramsar Convention and of the countries, but it's important. I mean, uh, it's important that we need we, we also need to have an environment to do the science and to understand. Yesterday, it was mentioned importance to to understand also the functions of of the wetlands, the integrity of the wetlands, and for this you need to bring all these data together. And and you know now we, we, we a lot of we, all the communities moving into this concept of digital twins, and uh, having a digital twins of the wetlands. Of course, having a digital of the wetlands means to have the the full catchment, eh? because usually the wetlands are downstreams and they are impacted by what's happening upstream. But anyway, this is a very important uh, part of the discussions we need to have in this and the Asian group to see what is what are the priorities. Um, what unfortunately today we don't have the time to see how we put all these um, these pieces of the puzzle together and make it easily accessible uh, by, by the countries. Because at the end of the day, what we want is to offer a solution to, to, to countries. And this morning we discussed a bit this, that there's not a solution that fits all. Uh, we need to be inclusive. So we don't want to force a given data sets or given platforms or given tools. So we need to offer everything, uh, all what is available, but in a way that e countries understand easily uh, what they can get out of it and, and how they, uh, they can make use of it. So, uh, so we need to be inclusive, but we need to be also transparent on, on what we can do with each part of, um, of the systems. Huh? So, uh, so that's all work. All work for us, I think, in the second step. Uh, today, I well, think there's not we enough have, time. We have this, uh, this full uh, scope of but, all existing from the platform in Gabon, where you see it's also an educative thing to exactly the Ramsar needs and then the more scientific platforms that Frederick just presented. I think it's it's great to have, because it was hard to have actually to, 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 to imagine how to brainstorm this discussion about platform without seeing the diversity. I think now we have it. So now I think we can work again on that, on this content and try to orient it this, uh, this next step. Uh, but for that, I, I still think we are, we are uh, so we'll have time with Madia at the end. I would like that we jump quickly to, to Madia and, uh, and, uh, and Alessio, Alessio Sata from Medwet. Alessio was very nice to invite us to uh, uh, promote some regional collaboration. Madia, the floor is yours now. We, think we, we, we spoke enough. Please, uh, Madia and Alessio. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Madiha Bajwa. I am uh, the, the work program, program coordinator uh, that joined the Geo Secretariat last week. Um, I will be facilitating this session together with Alicio. Alicio, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself and a little bit about Medwet as well. Uh, <laughs> back again. Sorry. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you. And I'm Alessio Sata. I'm coordinator of the Ransa Regional Initiative for the Mediterranean, Medwet. And this afternoon, we will also have a presentation of another uh, Ransal Regional Initiative. And uh, also I'll uh, also introduce you 
some you know some background on what the Ramsar Regional Initiative is. We had a nice discussion this morning, and I think that we will continue with this feeling. Super, thank you, Alessio. So this session will essentially focus on how regional collaboration can guide how this wide array of EO products and services and platforms that we've been hearing about over the course of today and yesterday um, can be developed and distributed and used further at the country level and help us augment our results and impact. We want to really connect um, the, the Geo Wetlands Initiative with these regional collaboration efforts. So we've structured this session into two parts. And the first, we're going to be hearing from Geo Wetlands, I assume Mark, who will share with us their experience to date in fostering and engaging at the regional level and where they see potential um, based on what also uh, Mark, you've heard over the course of the morning session and yesterday as well. Then we're going to have a few presentations that Alessio mentioned that are going to give us examples of how regional collaboration can work, may give us ideas of where the gaps are or where we can integrate better. And that leads us into the second set part of the session, which is the brainstorming part. And there we're going to go back to Miro. Um, and if you open it now, you're going to see that there are two green open tables where you can drop in post-its. And we've got two questions. Um, the first one is, which regional collaboration actions should be included in the Geo Wetlands Implementation Plan? This is the project document that we're going to talk about in the next uh, session. And the second question is, how can Geo Wetlands support wetlands-based solutions implementation and monitoring? So you'll see um, the post-its from the earlier session are there already. So feel free to complement those, add on to those, repeat them if you feel that they're making compelling arguments. And then um, the team of Geo Wetlands with us and eventually this uh, brainstorming or leadership group will come together and try to unpack them further into a project plan. Um, before we move on to the, the, the presentations, can we please give us a minute to, um, uh, to, to Ernest, um, who's going to introduce himself. He joined the Geo Secretariat last week with me, and he is our capacity building coordinator, and uh, um, he'll be working closely with regional geos. So that's another piece of the puzzle as well that we need to think through. So over to you, Ernest, please. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madea. Um, I'm very delighted. Uh, my name is Ernest Champo, and I'm very delighted to be part of uh, today's um, workshop. Um, I think um, um, listening to the presentations, it gives me a lot of ideas about how capacity development uh, will play a critical role in terms of how decisions are made, in terms of how data are processed, um, and utilize at the national level. And so it is exciting for me. Um, it is also uh, exciting for me to also present um, um, part of what is going to happen to uh, national levels um, networks. So I, I look forward to a much more detailed understanding of what is going to happen as far as the geo wetland is, is concerned, and also how we can utilize data um, to conserve wetlands, because as you, you could hear from the, um, the Gabon um, presentation, there are a lot of challenges regarding um, the conservation or protection of wetlands. And part of it is the lack of understanding, the lack of awareness about the relevance and importance of um, conserving wetlands. And so this is an opportunity to continue to build a consortium of aspects who will be able to produce important data and information to influence decision making um, in the geo member country. So this is an exciting time. Looking forward to more presentations. Thank you very much, Madea. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Alessio, but just to also mention that we're going to have a short presentation on NBS and ecosystem accounting in wetland environments by Daniel Jund as well. That'll follow 
the presentations by Alessio and Osvaldo. So with that, over to you, Alessio. So just a, a quick view on Ramsar Regional Initiatives uh, that are the one of the mean of the uh, convention uh, to, uh, let's say, to as an operational tool to uh, provide effective support for and improve the implementation of the objectives of the convention. So um, one of the, uh, the aim of the, uh, these regional uh, cooperation tools, it's really to improve cooperation on wetland related issues with uh, uh, other organizations. Uh, of course, first of all, the contracting parties of the Ramsar Convention that are, uh, let's say those that really behind the, the Ramsar Regional Initiatives, but also other actors and the civil society, of course. Um, let me show you the, the, the galaxy of this Ransa Regional Initiative that is quite diverse. We have four regional centers uh, covering the Western Hemisphere, Western Central Asia, Eastern Asia, and Eastern Africa, and 15 Ransa Regional Networks in various regions. Uh, um, among this one, we will have today, uh, I will give you a short presentation about MEDWET, so about the Mediterranean uh, Regional Initiative, and we will also have our friend Osvaldo from Ramsar Creo, Centro Regional para el Hemisferio Occidental. Uh, so um, if you uh, agree, uh, Madia, I will go straight to present MEDWET. And then I'll give the, the floor to Osvaldo Jordan. Okay, so just a just few words uh, to, uh, to, to show the, also the complexity, but the, the, the value of such platforms of co for cooperation. In case of Medved, Medved brings together 27 countries, pure Mediterranean countries uh, facing the, 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 the the shore of the Mediterranean, and at the same time, some other countries that are linked uh, <coughs> to Mediterranean flyways, like Bulgaria, for example. There is also uh, the, the bridge between Mediterranean and Black Sea. Then we have a secretariat. Uh, first of all, in the, in the Mediterranean Initiative, we also have IUCN and WWF and Tour du Vala as permanent members. And we have other two uh, tools um, that are, let's say, quite relevant for the discourse we are having today. That one is the Mediterranean Wetland Observatory that is led by the, the Tour du Vala and is very much involved in earth observation work. And uh, the Mediterranean, the MedWet Scientific and Technical Network, which is composed by 54 experts and researchers from 11 countries. And finally, uh, the Mediterranean uh, Wetland Managers Network. So one of the aim of MedWet is addressing the knowledge gap on the status and trends of wetlands in the region. And we do this thanks to uh, the Mediterranean Wetlands Observatory. Of course, for us, this is the, the, the basis of any kind of collaboration we can envisage with the so-called geo community. Um, Another point that is also very interesting to, to, to consider is the a huge network of Ramsar sites. Uh, if you see just in this map, we have more than 400 Ramsar sites that are part of this MedWet network. And of course, that are um, not always facing the Mediterranean, but still in, uh, in depending on the same contracting parties. Uh, one of the main challenge of MedWet and one of the challenge that we want to share with you and uh, is the mapping potential areas for wetland restoration at pan-Mediterranean scale. So this is very much one of our priority for the next three years. And we consider that is exactly where we like to, to, to uh, start collaborating with, with the gel community. Um, finally, uh, also the policy part, 
uh, both in governance and in uh, uh, restoration, as, as far as we are concerned in the um, restoration law at the European level, and we are lobbying with other organizations, and this is a policy paper that um, the, we issued for Re Re restoration of Mediterranean wetlands. So I, I completed, I will not go too far, but let me stress really the importance of um, uh, en en enlarging this collaboration, this platform of collaboration, including the geo community. I know that some of you that are here are already involved somehow in the in the medwet processes and i'm very happy to see you here uh, but i'm sure there is room for more and more collaboration so i immediately give the floor to osvaldo uh, welcome osvaldo again good morning um a great pleasure to talk to you today uh creo as mentioned Alessio is one of the four regional training centers of the ransom convention we were the first to be created in 1999 through a resolution of the conference of the contracting parties uh, meeting in San Jose, Costa Rica. Here you can see the map of the different regional training centers. We also cover um, a number of countries, 30 countries, more than 400 Ramsar sites in the Americas and the Caribbean, which represents a main challenge. Our purpose is essentially to contribute to the wise use and conservation of wetlands in the Western Hemisphere, a vital source for human populations and biodiversity through capacity building based on the technical implementation of the Ramsar Convention. Naturally, um, the use of Earth observation uh, data is very important for us in this task. We are already above uh, 15 years as an organization, and uh, we do our main work uh, with the countries is training. Uh, we do a number of training activities but we also realized that we needed to have a research component in order to understand the topics that we are um, working on. Um, one of the main challenges um, about uh, many years ago, eight years ago, when the government of Panama asked us to define some uh, wetland areas, which was a mosaic. And this is one of the main challenges uh, when we are talking about uh, earth observation. There are some very homogeneous uh, uh, ecosystems but some are very patchy and very complex, especially in the tropics. This is the Darien region in Panama, where we began doing this work. We also began working in the transboundary wetlands between Panama and Costa Rica. These were areas where many organizations had been working before to a number of transnational initiatives like the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor and other more local like Corredor Biologico Talamanca Caribe in Costa Rica and Alianza Bocas in Panama sponsored by IUCN. And uh, we had the support of these organizations plus the government of Costa Rica when we began doing the surveys back in 2019. These are very important areas uh, to implement several of the resolutions like the conservation of sea turtles and also areas that have been identified as important uh, for peatlands. When you look at these ecosystems, then you look at a, a complex situation in which it's not easy to define what is wetland, what is not wetland, and what kinds of wetlands you are working with. In the left side, you see uh, these areas uh, classified as wetland by the Ramsar Convention, which are areas of coral reefs. On the right side, uh, this kind of vegetation in um, the area between Nicaragua and Colombia forms large stands that store carbon and that have an importance for uh, carbon mitigation and adaptation. However, not a lot of science developed into these areas of raffia pond, as they are called. That is where we need to collaborate very closely with uh, people in academia, with the different systems that you're talking about. Yes, including mangroves, but also including other kinds of ecosystems. Here you can see the area to the left will be Costa Rica, to the right will be Panama. Here you can see the peatlands, uh, you will see mangrove in different points, but then uh, coral reefs, but then you're gonna see all these other complex vegetation that are not that easy to sift through and to separate when you are doing the remote sensing work. Um, that's the reason we have been collaborating with institutions in the different countries, in this case, 
I can mention uh, the National University of Costa Rica, uh, University of Florida and Gainesville that has been helping us a lot with our work. And later I'll mention also McGill University in Canada. With this collaboration, we can do the training that is required as part of our mandate. In this case, the course that we developed in 2019 in Guanacaste in Costa Rica. Another complexity we face is we, we deal with migratory species like shorebirds that move between different places. And that's where the challenge of earth observation and remote sensing becomes, you know, gets to the limit. We are fortunate to collaborate at this point with the Coastal Solutions Program, the Cornell University Lab of Ornithology. And uh, with them, we are working in this region in Panama called Parita Bay, where a number of sites have been identified as important places for shorebirds. Of course, the detection system for shorebirds are very limited, and that's the reason we are also working with more conventional technology, like overflights. Here you can see how you get developed areas by salt uh, in production and shrimp farms, and areas which are uh, slated for conservation. Uh, with this, I want to finish the presentation. I believe um, I stuck to the five minutes, you know, um, I'm also willing to get into some more questions. Uh, this is a view of those uh, coral reef areas I told you about, thanks to the support of the government of Costa Rica, and um, invite you to uh, try to bridge this gap between the work that is done with research, global databases, regional databases, and the work that we try to do, taking that information into capacity building and putting that to the service of the end users. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Osvaldo. And your last reflection is extremely pertinent to us as the GEO community. Um, we're also looking towards moving from research to operational solutions. So um, thank you for that. With that, may I uh, turn the floor over to Jan Daniel. Daniel, are you ready? Yes, hello, Medea. Thanks very much. And um, Max uh, Wright uh, and I flipped a coin for the privilege to present today, and Max won. So I'm gonna hand the floor over to Max, who leads the Secretariat for uh, Earth Observation for Ecosystem Accounting. Um, Max, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and could I ask uh, the previous presenter to stop sharing screen so that I can uh, share my presentation? <laughs> Thanks a lot, I'm trying to do that, but I need some <laughs> tech support. <laughs> if they no worries. Remotely, it would be very helpful. <laughs> All right, well, while the tech uh, works on, on getting the screen share situation sorted, I'll just uh, introduce uh, myself. Uh, my name is Max Wright, and I help to co-lead the uh, Secretariat for the Earth Observation for Ecosystem Accounting Initiative in GEO. Um, the, the goal of the Earth Observation for Ecosystem Accounting Initiative, or our mission, is to um, utilize, is to bring Earth observation into the, into the accounting community to uh, to amplify the adoption of ecosystem accounts through the application of earth observations. Um, and so, you know, why is that so important is, you know, if we're going to build, um, you know, nature-based solutions and build uh, sustainable um, economies, we need to incorporate the values and the benefits that nature provides into that uh, decision-making process. And so to do this, um, we have, we use the, uh, the SIA, which is the, oh, here we go. I'm going to pull up my screen because it's going to be, I think, much easier for you guys to follow. So I want to talk a little bit about the SIA, which is the System of Environmental Economic Accounts. And essentially, this is the, the system that the United Nations Statistical uh, Division um, has ratified to account for the value of nature. And, and, you know, within this system we have, we start with identifying the extent of natural of ecosystems, then the condition or the ecological integrity of those systems the services that they provide, and then, um, and then measuring those, those benefits in, in both monetary and non-monetary terms. Um, and so, you know, really the, the goal of ecosystem accounting is to, is to move from data silos, which are collected by individual agencies and institutions, um, and kind of integrate that information so we have a full picture of, of both the economy and the environment, and we can use that for decision-making, to support decision-making. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, our, our initiative is, uh, seeks to, to bridge this gap and to make Earth observations more usable um, for ecosystem accounting. And you know, within our membership, we have national governments, uh, uh, representative of national governments, academic institutions, uh, international government organizations, and NGOs. 
So I want to talk quickly about one case study, uh, an early case study in San Martin, Peru, um, where we implemented ecosystem, uh, some experimental ecosystem accounts in the uh, province of San Mar in the department, excuse me, of San Martin. Um, so, you know, in this project, we developed these uh, experimental ecosystem accounts. This was before the CEO was officially ratified. So this is one of the early pilot studies. But interestingly, you know, after we, we con concluded this analysis, it was shown that, you know, natural ecosystems were the eighth largest sector in San Martin. Um, so of all the 32 economic sectors that are tracked on an annual basis, ecosystems were the eighth most valuable. And you know, as I don't have to tell this community, but you know, wetlands are an extremely high value ecosystem. And, and through this analysis, we, we showed that you know, this uh, particular type of wetland called Aguajales in San Martin um, was just super important for both um, human well-being as well as biodiversity. Uh, and, you know, it, at, uh, at the local level, it's used for um, you know, food, uh, for construction, bush meat. It also uh, is useful for mon um, regulating hydrological flows and, um, and uh, maintaining uh, water uh, quality. And, uh, and then globally, they're super important for carbon storage. So when we actually measured everything up, it turned out that these, peat, these palm swamps, these Aguajales wetlands, were significantly more, val more valuable or had a higher value than the other ecosystems in Peru which was interesting because they were also being converted to rice patties at an alarming rate. And on a per hectare basis, the rice from this region was actually less economically productive than the natural Aguajales had been. Um, and so, you know, when we presented these results to the, 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 the department government, um, you know, they, they actually took this information and, um, and used it to craft policy to, de to incentivize uh, low producing rice paddies to be restored back to Aguajales so they can maintain those ecosystem service benefits. Um, you know, I just, just, you know, all this is in the context of kind of these nit nitro-based solutions, but in order to get to nature-based solutions, we have to be able to understand the interactions between the environment, the economy and people. And that's really what the Earth, Obs ecosystem, Earth Observation for Ecosystem Accounting Initiative um, is seeking to do. So with that, um, thank you so much for your time. And you know, if you'd like to reach out, learn more about our initiative or get involved, um, you can contact uh, either Daniel June or myself, our emails are in the corner. And, um, and we're very excited to be here as part of the, the Geo Wetlands Ideation. Thank you. Thank yeah, you I so might, much. I might, <clears throat> I might also you. add, I, I apologize, Mahidiha. Thanks, thanks very much, Max. And, I know we wanna move into the discussion phase, but it's been a real privilege uh, to be part of this discussion over the past couple of days. And we're definitely interested in continuing to uh, participate with geo wetlands. You know, one thing out of Max's presentation to note is the question of where we can look at wetland ecosystem services and collaborate on those issues and places already from yesterday's discussion on, and you know, we're speaking with Adrian about possibly collaborating in Rwanda and places like that. So look forward to the discussion part of this, um, but thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Max. That was very interesting. And um, I was really happy to hear you talk about nature-based solutions. It's something that we're hoping to also package as one of our nexus areas going forward. So um, more on that in the next session as well. And uh, Daniel, on your point on uh, talking about specific countries, that is also something we need to think through as we articulate the implementation plan um, for geo wetlands going forward. What is the scale of ambition that we need to have uh, going forward? What is the scale of ambition for the next year? Where do we prioritize? Do we look at specific subregions, countries? Are we going global and big? So this is these are all questions to the to the community and those that have been involved in the initiative uh, in the past and those who wish to be involved going forward. But um, let's now open up for discussion. Alessio, um, shall we go to um, our trustee Miro board? Yeah, just a few words on nature-based solution, wetland-based solution. We really believe that wetlands have not yet, uh, let's say, reached the level of interest that they deserve. That means to be in the top of the agenda. We see some changes, like changes happening uh, at the European level, but also at the international organization. 
in the UN restoration decade, we see peatlands. So there, there are many things happening, of course, but we consider it's still a lot, much work to do, more work to do in terms of giving uh, wetlands what they deserve. So we consider that uh, this opportunity to show how wetlands can really, one of the most effective nature-based solution is one of the pathway that we can definitely consider for mainstreaming this, all the, all the work and all the, 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 the activities that we are doing in our respective uh, missions, of course. So you know, I'm very much interested in also to Miro to, to understand how you see this opportunity. We have, I will put in the chat, uh, have, we have a project funded by MAVA that is called Wetland Based Solutions, uh, is in the Mediterranean, but we are exper experimenting and testing many uh, restoration uh, cases and many other uh, also a few activities on blue carbon, etc. So I'm very much interested in how uh, this community can contribute and how we can contribute to this community uh, to make this, uh, let's say, uh, common objective um, real and concrete. All right, thank you, Lucio. I assume everyone can see the board. It's really far, Laurent. Um, it's uh, <laughs> impossible to decipher, but you know what, um, there are a few points that uh, maybe I can already touch upon and, and um, people can chime in. So the first question was, which regional collaboration actions should be included in the Geo Wetlands Implementation Plan? And what we're reading is, and now I believe you can see, um, someone said the first step could be to define which regional initiatives are of relevance and then to define their role and how to engage them. We've also seen that the exchange of no local knowledge is considered an important part of regional collaborative actions, data access and knowledge sharing. Does anyone have any initial reflections? Mark, uh, we haven't heard from you yet. Would you like to say anything based on what you can see in terms of these responses? No. Oh. It's clear that uh, you have to understand that the, the regional initiative is um, a part of Ramsar, a part of the process. Huh? They even have to report to, uh, to the, they were started, let's say, from Ramsar, and, they, and, and they're part of the process and need to report to Ramsar. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an, an, an important player of, Rams, of Ramsar. They are led by uh, contracting parties of Ramsar in collaboration with a number of organizations. Huh? So they are the, the, the famous IPOs from, from Ramsar, so these international partner organizations like IUCN or WWF or, or BirdLife, but there are also other, other partners like the civil society. The, the regional initiatives are very important because they provide you, for, for two reasons. One, one reason is because they provide you uh, a, a, a geographical context. Huh? And we, we know how diverse are the wetlands uh, so you, you don't work in I don't know in the in the pitlands in the in, if we talk about the pitlands huh? we don't look, we don't work in the in the in the pitlands up north in the in the high latitude in the same way as we work in the in the in the tropic pitlands so it's clear that um, by working with um, with the regional initiatives we we have this uh, this geographical focus that allows us really to to tailor our solutions to what the, the regions need and and one of the f of the strengths they have is the is the fact that uh, that you can do some pilot project with some of the countries and they can act as multipliers huh? because they are there as well to, to 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 support the implementation of the convention so whatever solution that fits let's say the regions through the, the mechanism of these um, regional uh, initiatives of AMSA with the pop, the possibility really to reach out to hold all the contracting parties within that region. So it's clear that the capacity development, uh, I think it's mentioned in, 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 in the MIRO, is something really essential. I think when, when we will come to build capacities in, in countries, we need to work with the regional initiative, but we have also, they are also there to, um, to, to help us understanding the needs. So we have also, we can use them as well to, to, to define what should be our priorities. Because it's not that, uh, of course, we have priorities that will be um, relevant for all countries, but in some cases, we have priorities that are also specific to some regions. And, and this is also where they can really um, bring a lot. And uh, a point that I mentioned this morning access to inside to data. 
uh, all those who have done remote sensing and Earth observations know that actually it's not a solution that only uh, depends on satellite data. You, you need to, to get access to inside to data for various reasons sometimes, because you've heard about machine learning, for example. Machine learning can only work if you have training data. And very often training data are only obtained from uh, going on the field. So it's important to have uh, some good inside to data, some good field data uh, to train our model, to calibrate our models, to validate our data, and, and sometimes to be part of the solution as well. Eh? So, uh, and, and this can, I think the regional initiatives are really important in that perspective as well, because of course they, they have this, 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 um, this possibility to mobilize, let's say the countries and, and, and the NGOs, eh? the NGOs are, are part of the solution, the citizens are part of the solutions. So, uh, so I was trying to throw a few, a few, a few ideas, but I've seen in the Miro there's even more than what I just said. Super, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And we have a question in the chat from Laura who asks, is there a list of existing regional initiatives we could link to? Is there a mapping of, I see nodding heads. Can someone clarify, please? Sorry, I'm I asking for the floor. I don't okay. know if you it's, saw me. Please go ahead. It's thank better, you. It's, it's better if Maria answer. answer this, yeah. Thank you. So thanks a lot as well for the for the very interesting presentation we are seeing in this 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 afternoon regarding regional initiative. I think that uh, Alessio in the, his presentation um, <laughs> uh, presented this slide. With there are all of them. Actually, there are 19 regional initiatives. You can find information in our website in regional initiative. You can see them. Some of have. Um, a specific websites where you can as well reach out to more concrete uh, activities that they are doing as met with Creo and other ones that were highlighted highlighted today. But I would like to come back to, to the point of, of course, as we mentioned this morning, they are like um, an operational arm to support contracting parties implementation mainly of the strategic plan in geographical regions. They have, of course, governance bodies as well. And I think that I will come back as well with the comment I made on the first day I, that uh, that is very important with all these processes in the geo community um, are based on the needs that are coming directly from contracting from contracting parties uh, needs. And they are just as well implemented based uh, according to the um, um, guidance that that is provided under the convention in order that the process is fully is fully aligned and really when party report on the different process under the convention the data and information can be fully used for the purposes and objectives of the of the convention so it's the same case for regional initiative we see them as well as one of our key players and our key actor as well in all this process that as well that we continue regarding capacity building and training because they are will be of course the champions in the region uh, regarding the the first ones to talk about uh, the convention objectives and uh, what will be expected of course if they are involved in processes of course that is they are fully aligned with contracting parties expectation as i said they are very diverse that is the very important thing. So they do, some of them are more focused on capacity building, some others do a little bit more of research. So they are, they are very, <laughs> a community as well, that is very, that very diverse. So it's important to take that in consideration. But I think as well, there are plenty of other initiatives that are out there uh, as well. And I suppose that this in Miro <laughs> will be reflected not only runs a regional initiative, but or regional processes. UNEP as well have a lot of, a lot of presence uh, regionally uh, and uh, with different processes as, as well. I don't know that that will be reflected uh, at, at the regional level. There are also as well regional conventions like the Cartagena Convention or is one um, uh, that are also very active on, on different on different process. So it will, uh, will be good as well that those, those other uh, uh, regional processes that are out there could be as well somehow somehow reflected and at, as well operational arms of any of these processes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that helps. And I guess it would be great to actually have some sort of a mapping of not just the Ramsar regional initiatives, but also all these others that we've heard from in the last days and some that may not be present. I don't. Um, Laurent is pretty sure we've covered the entire uh, gamut of uh, possibilities, and I think we did. The, the presence uh, from across the regions has been phenomenal. But um, 
Are there any final thoughts, reflections before we move on to the next uh, session on what we should potentially do in terms of next steps? Alicio, do you have any uh, final reflections on um, um, engaging further with uh, uh, geo wetlands um, based on what you've heard in the last two days? <laughs> yeah, of course. We, today we saw a number of re some specific requests from some of our colleagues, some other that could be raised, I mean, uh, with a specific request from our side. Uh, I'm of course volunteering in terms of uh, even um, trying to put together all these elements, uh, at least in our world, that are the world of the Rams Regional Initiatives, and seeing how these elements, I mean, can uh, integrate uh, the mirror work, <laughs> and how we can uh, contribute to the to the your roadmap. Um, so yeah, I I think there are many many elements, but of course I don't think today we will be able to <laughs> to wrap up everything. Uh, but yes, I, I see personally, I'm very, very happy and satisfied with this workshop. It was very useful. So thanks a lot to Geo Group because you really allow us to, to, to you know, open our eyes to a huge world of science and, and collaboration. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And we have a hand raised from Ian Harrison. Please go ahead. Um, hi, thanks. I'll, I'll be really quick. So just... From the the things I've been hearing and, and looking on the seeing on the board, um, I think so. The, the the comments on looking on finding priorities and uh, for, for for action and uh, and, and specific to ecosystem types is going to be really useful um, towards um, on uh, ongoing initiatives in response to the post twenty twenty global biodiversity framework, particularly on target um, target three on on protected areas and the 30 by 30 process. So TNC and uh, the, the, the World Commission on Protected Areas Freshwater Specialist Group that I'm a part of, uh, uh, and a number of other parties are, 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 look, are starting to look at how we can best um, assess freshwater protections globally. And our biggest challenge is actually, is working out where those protections are. So obviously the geo wetland work that we've been talking about here is gonna be really important for that, particularly what types of ecosystems are being, are, 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 are protected, where they are, what the representation is spatially and, and, and functionally. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and then moving on from that, looking at well, what, how effective are those protections? I think some of the other things have, in terms of the, the ecosystem accounting um, that we heard about is, is, is going to be really useful for that. So I see that as being a, a, a very helpful application of, of, of this work. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Ian. And I see Mark taking notes. So we're, we're definitely um, reflecting and we will be reflecting on these thoughts. Um, a big thank you to Alicio and to our presenters, um, Osvaldo, Max, Daniel. Thank you all. Um, with that, I hand it back to Laurent. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madia. Thank you, Alessio. Congratulations for the great session. Thanks for, I mean, uh, uh, for Daniel, uh, Max, and Ian. Uh, I know Ian is a, uh, one of the well known uh, uh, wetland specialist. So it's very great to have such high level people engaged in these brainstorm uh, discussions that go in many directions. But as you see, we we try to actually be able to synthesize and and so now what we 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 have a, we don't have too much time to engage you, Madiha. I think it's uh, uh, it's time to 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 remind that uh, first this mirror platform will stay live. We uh, start in the morning to fill uh, some timelines on engagement uh, issues, and we would like to to discuss it for the last uh, in, instead of conclusion because it's very hard to conclude a, a brainstorm event. Huh? We mm -hmm. we we have difficulties. We it's so much information, but also we want to, to take the best of all of you. Huh? That's that's the idea. So, uh, Madia, do we do we do we want now to go on uh, um, and reminding some point about, for example the timeline with the implementation plan and then also invite people 
to save candidate or indicate possible candidate. I've, I was seeing Laura Hess hesitating to, to save candidate, so I, I pushed you a little bit, Laura. Sorry for that. Uh, you're, of course, uh, authorized to take your name out if somebody uh, uh, indicates you. Uh, it, 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 at this stage, we don't want to have people engage uh, on the geo weapons. We just want to have people that could help us until the geo week at the end of the year and even before in June uh, to submit an implementation plan and actually uh, um, uh, mobilize the geo community and also look for resources. So it would be an engagement until the, the end of the year with meetings that if you can participate, it's great. If not, we will also do it through mailing and, and other way of communication. But I would like to give the, the floor back to you, Maria, because I think what you have to say about implementation is is uh, is really important. Loma, I think you said it all. So I, I I think really we don't probably have the time to go into any great detail, but what you said is perfectly correct. Um, we need to do the implementation plan. This is just one tool to, to define um, the priorities and the focus of geo wetlands going forward. There is a bit of a time crunch on this. Um, uh, the, the implementation plan should be submitted by the end of June. Um, and, and, and for that purpose, we're asking for nominations of individuals that would like to be part of the, the, the brainstorming and the concretization actually from of, of, of the results framework and the focus of geo wetlands going forward. So what we're going to have in the implementation plan will be the way forward for geo wetlands for three years. It's not a static document. We can obviously keep revising and working on it as, as um, things become clearer. A big focus as the home mentioned is going to be on resources and figuring out how to, to design um, geo wetlands in a way that attracts resources. Um, and perhaps under the umbrella of nature-based solutions and part of a nexus that uh, connects with other elements within the geo work program is going to be the best way forward. But um, that is to be determined in, in, in further conversations from our perspectives. Please, please do um, nominate yourselves or others that might be beyond the space, but, um, but, but will be important to have in the conversation to be part of this group. Um, this, is, this is obviously your time, but uh, you're contributing to something important. And we've seen in the last um, two days that the, the, the interest and the passion is there. Um, and, and then we will be in touch with you um, for the specific requirements um, that are needed from a procedural um, basis, but, uh, but that's not all. That Thank is, you. I think, all yeah. that I would like yeah, to Yeah, we say. are almost there, my dear. Uh, I mean, trying to, to, to build this dream team, I mean, I, I, I'd like to invent, of course, people like Alessio, Sata, Evelyn Novo. I know, Evelyn, you're almost retired. You've, give, you've given so much. I feel bad to ask you, but I, we want you to be connected. Also, Jan Harrison, I know you are a wetland specialist. Uh, Daniel talked about you, and I see Daniel raise his hand. So, I mean, Conservation International people, I know you are already engaged in your foyer. If you can also support us uh, for this uh, uh, ideation. So, we didn't this, call it a leadership group because we said it's not a leadership. We called it an ideation co design engagement group members. And we, when we wrote that, we thought somebody will complain about the title and, and, and propose something else. It didn't work yet, but if you can make other proposal of, of, uh, of Bird's name for this group would be great. Daniel, I see your, 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 your hand is raised. Please, Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Laurent. I know we're running out of time. I, I mistakenly thought that we had till 1230 and we were going to go into a discussion phase. But, you know, with this wrap up and with the next steps in mind, you know, one thing that comes to my mind is, you know, <clears throat> what are the new directions that we've established during this ideation phase? You know, and one that comes to mind is the some of the stuff that Max presented and Ian reinforced, <clears throat> whereby, you know, I, I think a lot of what I've heard is the very important job of characterizing wetlands, which is a very difficult job. Um, and this is the group that's doing it well. And is the future of geo wetlands moving towards areas that are perhaps new to geo wetlands and geo uh, writ large, such as um, you know, determining the value of wetlands 
to further the argument and its role and its place in conservation and sustainability, right? So if we're gonna move into a nature-based solution stance, I think understanding the value of wetlands so it becomes part of the solution set and not just a, a, a biome to be protected, but um, you know, helping the global community foster those arguments that wetlands um, provide valuable services, carbon services, and integrate that within not only planning on the ground, but into the global dialogue and what role does geo wetlands play in that. And so if there's interest in following up on brainstorming st storming some of those issues with regards to ecosystem services and nature-based solutions afterwards, I, I, I definitely invite uh, that dialogue to take place by email or in separate meetings. Uh, for those uh, for those new directions, Daniel, thank you. And yeah, we 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 said we'll finish at four. So what we will do is that we will we will make an official end at four. But who wants to stay? And we did this this morning, and actually everybody stayed. But I know that people like Maria, well, Ramsakli, that stayed from very early this morning until now. So we don't want to ask this to everyone. So what we will do? We will make a closing, official closing, and wants to stay for the brainstorm more relaxed, we can still continue to, to discuss more 15 minutes in a more relaxed way, because I think it's if some people can, it would be great. I'd like to, to give two of these closing remarks, uh, Madia, if you agree, let's let's give the voice back to Jana and Maria. I mean, uh, uh, so uh, Maria and Ramsa will not be officially in the group, but we will discuss with them of all the steps and we will all always see if we are going in directions that answer the needs that they describe to be sure we really answer these needs as one of our priority. And also we will for surely uh, see how we can collaborate with the EO4A and Daniel, you were here and I think all what you said is perfectly meaningful, especially after this session that uh, Alessio moderated. So um, I would like first to uh, uh, give the floor to Maria and then Jana for some concluding uh, remarks. Thank you, Laurent. So uh, really thanks a lot. We are very pleased we have not only me, but other part of the team, you know, dedicated these two days <laughs> to, to, to this process uh, because we are involved <laughs> on this. So just as anyone has doubt of it, I hope it is not. Uh, and we are, uh, yes, we, we expect to continue collaboration. That is our, our aim even that we are not, of course, uh, being part of this small group. That is great that you have a small group uh, of to continue brainstorming, just taking all the inputs that we received. Then as I discussed, uh, mentioned earlier uh, with Jana, uh, we expect, of course, with the Geo Secretariat to continue bilaterally uh, the discussions because I we understand that the Geo Secretariat will be leading this process, taking on board this, uh, the main ideas that are that are that are there and then that will be shared with us and then of course we will continue the the discussions on the on the on the process and hopefully with the i don't know how you call it work plan or something like that the plan that uh, that you have with more concrete um, um, uh, ideas and activities to move forward in what concern regarding the objectives of the convention on inventories, inventory monitoring and indicator 61. So we will be pleased, as I said, to, to continue directly with you, Lorana, and with Jana, the, the discussions. Thank you. Maria, and thank you so much. And before giving uh, some f the voice of uh, the, the floor to, to Jana for some final comments on these two days, I would like to thank you so much, Maria, because we, we met at the CBD, we started discussion, we started really from zero. And when we started this discussion, we were a moment of Maya and myself started to discuss and we had the CBD, you know, around running and we entered it's such great discussion. This was so important moment. So I will always remember this, uh, this moment as a start of, uh, of this uh, amazing meeting. So thank you so much. And I will give the floor to, uh, to Jana now for some concluding remarks, reminding that who wants to say after for uh, chili chat are oh, welcome. Yana, please. Thank you, Luan, and really thank you so much to everybody. Uh, Maria and, and everyone really who joined in the last two days. Look, I this is my probably least favorite part of having to sort of conclude, um, especially when the energy is just so high. I think sort of we're reaching sort of this apex moment um, and I can tell you that we at the Secretariat have been so inspired by this 
um, two days worth of conversations that, and we are sort of raring to take this forward. And something Alessio was talking about was that, you know, wetlands are not yet quite talked about uh, widely. And in fact, one of the things we were just talking about today after the morning session is how we really need to create the buzz. And so um, I'm not going to talk about the implementation plan and other things. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that work forward. But one thing we do want to do is, in fact, this non-technical part, and that's communication and creating that buzz and putting the word out. Um, and I hope that your organizations, you, will work with us and will amplify the message that we, this group, this collective of biggest players in the wetland space are um, up to something really good. And um, so let's start creating that uh, global fan club of wetlands uh, right now, um, which I'm sure will garner more and more support, not just from governments, but um, all the sort of um, climate change enthusiasts as well. So look, we're excited. I hope you are um, as well. Our job is to keep you engaged. And uh, so we won't be going away for long. So thank you very much, Laurent, uh, our top MC. Thank you and over back to you. Thanks, Jana, and thanks also for, I mean, you know, some colleagues, uh, they, jumped, they just arrived at Jill last week, I'm thinking of Madiha and Ernest, and something like, such as Julie and Sam, you have to show your fails, Julie, I think we could, we could end this with a, uh, um, uh, let's, let's make a picture of everyone, we didn't do that, so that we can see every faces, we are so many, if you can just turn on your camera, uh, we don't really ask about any, oh, I see even Osvaldo in his car. Oh, Osvaldo, thank you. And so make a big smile. It's all recorded and uh, we are not asking for any, uh, authori uh, 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 any authorization. Just make a big smile. I see John Milak, impressive. John Milak to be to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. It was, was amazing, really was amazing. So um, have a good day. We will come back to you very soon. Who wants to stay for a chili chat? As I said, we, we can uh, take some moments. If you have some little things you want to, to say to the group, you're welcome. Bye, everyone. Thank you.